I am very excited to introduce Sherry Andes, who is the Executive Director of the National Alliance of Mental Illness, Massachusetts. For those who don't know, NAMI is the largest mental health advocacy organization in the United States. They do a lot of incredible work, some of which we heard about yesterday with Lisa Dixon, to really advocate for patients and families and make sure mental illness is heard and seen and we're doing something about stigma and focusing on the issues that matter. So it's an honor. Go ahead, Sherry. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Good morning, everybody. Um, can everybody hear me? So um, all of us have stories, and this is one of mine. My father was diagnosed with bipolar uh, disorder when he was 50 years old, which means that for most of uh, his life and my life, uh, and my family's life, uh, we lived without knowing uh, why things were the way they were, uh, and therefore without understanding it. One of the chief ways my father's bipolar disorder expressed itself was in his work life. He um, had a pattern where he would, he was a pharmaceutical salesman, and he had a pattern where he would work hard, he traveled for a living, where he would work hard for um, two, three years, and then he would, and really work hard, um, and then he would have a depressive episode, and he would go to bed for weeks at a time, quit or get fired, um, and then he would go back to work, um, maybe for a lesser time, and then he would go to bed for a longer time, and that cycle, um, you know, continued until the times when he was working were less than the times that he was in bed. Um, the last job my father held was when he was 50 years old. Um, he had lost by that time two homes, eight jobs, his dignity, and his joy. He was severely depressed, and he and my mom moved finally to a trailer in Florida and my father was finally diagnosed with his mental illness, the one that had challenged him all of his life and all of my life. After 10 years of treatment, uh, which he struggled to get, get the right um, treatment, I got a call from my mom. And the call was that he was having trouble with his cognition and with his speech that she had taken him to the doctors, and he had been diagnosed. They'd done a CAT scan. They had found a mass on his brain, and that uh, I should come immediately, and my brother and sister as well. Um, I spent two weeks by my father's bedside. Uh, the cortisone that the doctors um, uh, administered had helped to shrink the brain tumor enough that he could talk a little bit and um, he, his cognition improved. And um, he was a, a, a diabetic and so the, the, um, the hospital had him on a diabetic uh, um, diet. And my, my, when my brother and I arrived, he was able to tell us that what he really wanted was fushi. Um, and uh, <laughs> he was a great lover of sushi, um, so we s continued to smuggle fushi into the hospital for him. So he did have some idea about what he wanted um, and what was good for him. Um, but as he talked, he really didn't have much good to say. He was angry. Um, and, and he was an angry man in general, but he was really angry now. He was angry about having cancer. He was angry about having the myriad tests that they put him through. Um, really, I think every test that hospital uh, knew how to do. And he was, he was angry that he was probably gonna die very soon. Um, one day, um, I tried to cheer him up by showing him a video of my children playing on a beautiful beach in, in Cape Breton, Nova Scotia, where we had vacationed. And he, he wasn't cheered up. He very uh, 
sadly and, and, and angrily said, I would like to go there. Um, and, and that was telling to me. One night while I was sleeping in the bed next to him, um, he, he sat bolt upright in the middle of the night and he said, those doctors in Indiana told me there was something on my lung. And this was after spending a week and a half with him. And so I sat bolt upright in bed and I said, Dad, what are you talking about? It's about 2 a.m. He said, those doctors told me there was something on my lung. And so it was Columbus Day weekend. I couldn't do anything about it until Tuesday. But I tracked down the, the clinic, the last clinic he had, where he had worked his last job and where he had gotten his last real care. He had been there for pneumonia. They had, in fact, found a small spot on his lung. They had told him that he should have a cat, uh, an x-ray every six months to follow the progression of that spot. And uh, lo and behold, it was clear that the cancer that he was suffering from was lung cancer. And that was the, the test that the, the doctors were putting him through was to find the, the, the source of the brain tumor, what kind of cancer he actually had. So it became clear that he had lung cancer. And now the um, doctors could figure out what kind of treatment um, he needed. Um, so uh, they immediately began radiation treatment and prepared for chemotherapy. Um, I, I should say there were no discussions. I, I was there 24 hours a day except for when I went home to take a shower and one of my brother's sisters or mother relieved me. And th there, were, there were no discussions about you know, what was the right care or what was the appropriate care. There was just a, an aggressive treatment schedule. So um, they began radiation treatment, um, you know, burned his scalp, um, really depressed him further, um, and they prepared for chemotherapy, um, but uh, he died before they were able to start that. Um, so I share this story with you this morning in order to make several points. Um, the continuity of care for patients with um, you know, both um, spots on their lungs and other uh, diseases, but also uh, with severe mental illness and complex mental illnesses is so important. And the, um, you know, figuring out how to have medical records follow people, particularly across state lines, um, is such a difficult problem, but so important. Um, and, uh, and I just, you know, I, I just think that's so important. The second, and we've already discussed this this weekend, I was so um, happy to be in the palliative care workshop. Is anybody who gave that workshop here today? Yeah, I, I so appreciated that. Um, and, you know, the critical importance of family engagement and education and support, which our family just didn't have. Um, and in this small rural hospital, it just didn't exist. And finally, in, in contemplating the palliative care of a severely depressed patient with aggressive stage four lung cancer, the involvement in everybody in an open conversation about what is the good life in this particular patient at this particular time. And that wasn't an obvious, um, that wasn't obvious but it required a conversation, and that conversation never happened. Um, and so we all um, had a lot of second thoughts, a lot of grief around, did, did we do the right thing uh, for my father? Um, so I've just been speaking primarily as a family member, a daughter. Let me now step back and, and speak ever so briefly as the executive director of NAMI Mass. Um, so many of us who are touched in our lives by stories like these become motivated to take action. Um, it, it even motivates our professional careers. Um, sometimes this motivation stems from a desire to see a particular policy changed, a policy that's deeply affected our own lives, our loved ones, or those, uh, the lives of those we care for. But others are more generally motivated to act. They are motivated by the twin emotions of grief and gratitude. 
Feelings of loss, profound sadness, anger, and frustration over the way things are systematically, certainly. But also, often, gratitude for the support they have found, care they have been given, compassion they have been shown. And they want to act, and they want to give back. It is on all of us in this room to respectively tap into that grief and that gratitude. And with the same person-centered approach that we use for a care model, learn about people's hopes and desires for a better healthcare system and organize that to achieve it in collaboration with them. Thank you. <laughs>